you know, in, in my little buy box, we're at about a month's inventory, whereas even a busy market should be at least three months inventory. It's just mm. ridiculously tight and, and people are willingly overpaying for, for, for real estate that they know is, is not worth it. They're, whether it's renovated or unrenovated, it's just trying to get something to rent out or something to live in. It's, it's crazy. This is the Real Estate Investing Experience. We get it. Real estate can be rough sometimes. And that's why we bring in the experts to talk about the experiences you won't hear anywhere else. With your hosts, John Cohen and Chris Grinzik. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Experience. I'm your host, Chris Grenzig. With me, as always, is John Cohen. How are we doing, bud? We're good. Uh, we just wrapped up final best and final calls right before this um, on a property we're selling. Um, all calls went really well, and now uh, it's time to pick a buyer. So uh, we'll see how that shakes out. But uh, the calls were good. Last group was impressive. So uh, we shall see. Well, hopefully they don't hear this before that and get greedy, but we'll see what <laughs> happens. Um, but all good stuff. Not a not a bad way to start the beginning of the week. Nope. Awesome. Um, but let's jump into it. We got a great guest on today. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go on his podcast not too long ago, had a really great chat. So obviously wanted to bring him on. Happy to hear his story, his experiences, his insight. So that being said, Colin, thanks for jumping on, bud. Oh, great to be here, Chris. Yeah. So you want to just kick things off real quick, take a couple minutes, give people a little context about you, where you're from, your background and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So my name's Colin Murphy. I'm originally from Ireland, but I'm living in Tampa, Florida now. I'm a pretty traditional fix and flipper here in the Tampa market, uh, buying, renovating single family homes in middle class areas, selling them to out-of-state investors. I've done about 350 in the last four or five years. And, um, you know, before that, I had a kind of very real estate career, worked in London for several years in real estate publishing and real estate exhibitions. I lived in Madrid. Spain for 10 years while I did a lot of investing in the Florida market and ran a you know property flipping business from Madrid for a lot of it. Had to move over here in 2016 with my wife and two kids because the market was was just booming and really wanted to give it a push and wanted to you know expand my own portfolio and get loans. Um, I like dabbling in a lot of different things. I, I buy a lot of real estate and foreclosures. I like lending money to other flippers. I invest in loan notes, um, experimenting with tax deeds. I just love real estate, love hanging out with other people. I love real estate and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And um, last six months have been, have been interesting as well, but you know, basically real estate investor full time. I'm 40 years old now. I've been investing in real estate since my mid twenties and can't really see myself doing anything else for the foreseeable future. Love it. I think, Really interesting story. Definitely want to pick into it a little bit more because I'm curious. We don't have a ton of people coming from overseas and doing it from overseas in the U.S. market. So I uh, would love to learn more about that. So how did you actually get your your start into real estate? So I mentioned I was in London for, I think, three years working for a big company that did property exhibitions and property magazines. So I was selling adverts in the magazines and encouraging agents and developers all over the world to come to shows, to come to the Manchester show, the Liverpool show, the London, the Dublin show to sell their stuff to British and Irish investors. So I got to meet and travel a lot. I mean, nonstop, really uh, meeting agents, developers, currency experts, lenders, all, all sorts of people. And I, I met a lot of people, real work hard, play hard time, a lot of networking, got some really great insights. And this was in the early 2000s, which was the boom before the, the current boom. We remember this is kind of 2003, four, five, six. And one of the companies that I really got on well with another young company, a couple of guys in their mid twenties had started selling real estate in, in Eastern Europe and Central and South America to the British buyers and started developing their own products in, in these areas. It's an incredibly ambitious young company. And they asked me after a year or so of getting to know each other to open an office for them in Dublin. This is back in 2006, early 2007. So yeah, I opened an office in Dublin and started promoting their real estate in places like Belize and Panama and Argentina and Bulgaria and Romania to Irish investors and was doing hotel seminars and traveling to these places. And it was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was a lot of fun and hired some really good people in the office. And, uh, you know, then obviously the credit crunch hit in 2008. 
Lehman Brothers collapse collapsed in in uh, no Bear Stearns collapsed in March 08, Lehman Brothers in September 08, and kind of that period in between March to September, the business model just kind of collapsed. Where you know this kind of demand for pre-construction real estate in in emerging markets, risky markets really compared to developed countries, it just evaporated and kind of had to get rid of the nice office, had to let go of three quarters of the staff, just kind of kept my sales manager and we just needed to, to pivot and we're like, well, what, what are we going to do next to keep the lights on? I was just engaged and, um, you know, he had his responsibilities as well. And we decided that we'd look at Florida. You know, he was a bit older than me. David shows his name and he'd bought and sold um, a single family home in, I think, Kissimmee near Orlando and done quite well out of it. So he said, I think Orlando is in a lot of distress at the minute. There might be some discounted properties that we could offer to our database of buyers. So we, uh, Flew to Orlando, met a bunch of people that had got the timing wrong with condo conversions, you know, where they, a lot of people bought a 150 units for 6 million, spent a million and a half fixing them up, and then would sell them individually and, and make very nice profits. But obviously, if you got your timing wrong, you were totally screwed because financing just evaporated for condos in, in 08, 09. And a lot of those people just put tenants in there to try and generate some income to service their mortgages. And just ran out of runway. So people like me were, were kind of one of the early birds to come in and say, we'll set aside 30 condos for me, two beds, three beds, one beds, whatever, fixed prices, and I'll sell them to cash buyers overseas. And we just kind of developed a reputation for doing that and did a bunch of communities in Orlando and then moved on to some in, in Tampa and Jacksonville and, and other words. And then my business partners moved over to Florida full time and we expanded that. And again, you like anything, you, I feel like my career, I have to pivot completely every five years. So 2014, all that low hanging fruit, all those nice condos just went away. We were, before we were promoting like kind of B class condos, mm -hmm. like $75,000 that were rented for 900 that were selling for 220, 230 in the mid 2000s. It was a great investment. Um, but it all got hoovered up. Hedge funds got involved, big high net worth investors got involved. And whereas I used to sell B class condos for $80,000, three, four years later, people were offering me C minus for $90,000. And it's just, I'm not promoting that crap. So we just mm -hmm. had to stop it. And, and then that's how we became just fix and flippers ourselves. Just like I say, bought, bought a house, fixed it up, sold it, and, and just kind of grew that business up steadily over the years. I love it. I think that's an interesting story. One question that I have, and I'm curious to hear your take on it is mm -hmm. when I talk to newer investors or people that aren't as sophisticated, I'll say, and nobody take offense to that. A lot of people automatically think a higher cap rate for multifamily or commercial real estate just means it's better. You make more cash flow, it's a better deal. And I talk to a lot of people about risk reward. And it's very interesting to hear you talk about during the crash about those emerging markets and how they just got wiped out overnight. Do you think there was an imbalance of the risk reward that people didn't properly take into account at that time? Or was it another reason? Yeah, that, that was a huge part of it. And, you know, I, I'm sure it was like that here, but, but the Irish and British went completely nuts in the mid 2000s for real estate and, and lost all sense of, of risk awareness. And mm -hmm. the, everybody won. It went from, you know, Ireland went from being a pretty poor kind of developing country on the edge of Europe to one of the richest in the world per, per capita within about 15 years from the you know early 90s to the mid 2000s. And kind of affected our cultural personality a little bit. Whereas before you'd only kind of rich people could even afford to go on an overseas vacation. Now that was no longer enough. You needed to have an overseas vacation property and you kind of call it investment. So people were literally buying three houses off plan in Spain with the idea of selling two of them when they were finished and using that profit to pay for the third one. So now you have a free vacation home. Mm -hmm. And then when the Spanish and French properties got a little bit too expensive or, or just they weren't even that expensive, but people didn't want to spend a hundred thousand euros or 150,000 euros. They wanted something for 40,000 euros or 50,000 euros. So that's why they started buying in countries like Bulgaria or Romania or, you know, all, all these kinds of places, which are much less developed countries with local populations earning very low salaries. And, you know, that's just the European model, but you could take that experience and apply it anywhere to America. You, you had people investing in, in all sorts of low income, uh, poor quality C and D class multifamilies where they're like, well, it's, it's 
like this is back in, like back in 2009, 10, you could buy, and you know this well, you could buy condos for ten, fifteen thousand dollars You you could buy communities for ten, fifteen thousand dollars a door. And people were thinking, well, what's what can go wrong? It's just fifteen thousand bucks or twenty thousand bucks. But the, <laughs> a lot can go wrong. That that can cost you five thousand dollars a year <laughs> just to own it. You know, I mean you, you might have a spreadsheet showing you rent is seven hundred a month and expenses are three hundred a month, but the reality is is that you know, in some areas, you'd be lucky to get more than eight months rent a year, and, and you're going to have repairs that exceed that by quite a margin. So there's a lot of kind of common sense that older generations would, would probably have, have known better than our generation. Um, but a lot of the fundamentals were, were forgotten in the mid-2000s and probably forgotten again in the 2010 to 14 period when there was a lot of good deals available as well. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think It's funny, while you were talking about the price per door, when I'll talk to my family or friends who have, you know, no involvement in real estate, they'll say, one of the questions I'll get is, why do you invest in Florida? Like, why aren't you doing it in New York? Is it because it's cheaper? I'm like, it is cheaper, but it's not why we're investing in other areas. It's not because I can buy the same property for a third of the price or a tenth of the price it's, you know, it's a risk reward thing. Everything has to be measured upon itself. You shouldn't just buy something because it's cheaper. And it sounded like that's what people were doing in Europe. They were basically going to these other areas and saying, I can buy the same thing in, I believe you said Bulgaria and another area for Mm -hmm. cheaper than what I can buy it in Spain. And they were basically just penny pinching, chasing dollars, trying to find the next thing. And living on a prayer that it would kind of work a lot of it was just so they could boast to their friends that they own real estate overseas a lot of it was as stupid as that that they would spend forty thousand or fifty thousand dollars or euros which is a lot of money uh, just so they could both say i own a property it's appreciating by 15 percent a year i'm going to rent it out you know going to get a 10 percent return the developer is guaranteeing five percent of it i mean it's just a lot of silliness that that we're all a little older and wiser now and and you know, certainly for the last six, seven years, I've been keeping my life very simple, just investing in lower middle class suburban areas with, with just nice, simple houses and, and regular local tenants that are there living there year round with solid blue and middle class collar jobs. That kind of stuff is, is pretty consistent and pretty, mm-hmm. pretty predictable. And I'm not really one for the kind of gambling anymore where I'm buying something because they might build an airport or they might build a golf course or you might get an influx of tourists or you know, somebody might decide to build something next door that will increase the value of this as well. I mean, I prefer not to gamble on any of that stuff. Just stick with something simple that works in every kind of cycle that's worked in every generation, which is this kind of middle class mm-hmm. rentals that have good rental and, and owner demand. So in your experience then seeing this, how have you combated not getting too caught up in the hype, not putting a too much risk versus reward? You know, like how have you continued to stay disciplined throughout this and not get, you know, the market keeps ticking up and up and up where you feel, hey, maybe it's becoming hyperinflated, overpriced, et cetera. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, part of it is just I've got the scars from the last one. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, in one sense, I was lucky that when I had to, you know, shut down a business and and lay off a bunch of people, I was still relatively young, kind of 27, 28. So I wasn't really old enough to have accumulated a lot of assets myself that would have lost a ton of value. So one way that was lucky, but I saw a lot of big businesses Uh, crashing. I saw a lot of people losing their life savings. It's not fun letting anybody go from hardworking people in the office, letting them go. I was owed hundreds of thousands of dollars from people that just defaulted on the commissions they owed me for those properties. And I I just, and even just going to all those exhibitions all around the UK and and Dublin, and and just the, the, the excess was, was tremendous. It was just, you could tell that it was, it was nuts. You could tell that it was just too much. And, um, I was just a little bit too young to to kind of participate in it as fully as everyone else was. So I saw how bad the crash was and I felt the crash in 2008 and 2009. And when I set up, you know, different, the new business in 2009, late 2009 called Torcana, we did it with a totally different mindset. Instead of having the glossy offices with the, you know, pretty receptionists and the marketing people and the admin people and the accounting people and they say just tons of people, just like, you know, bare bones, 
no offices, everybody's working from home. Like I've literally been working from a home office since 2010 and we're, we're getting, we're doing a get rich slow plan here. We're, we're not going to try and throw gamble all our money. We're not going to try and make a hundred thousand bucks and then just slap that down on another gamble to make 200,000 bucks. We just did it slowly, 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 not risking all our capital, just doing it year by year by year and just increasing our time accumulating rentals when we can and, and nursing losses every now and again, but never were they going to be big enough to, to knock us out because I'd seen a lot of people getting knocked out. So it wasn't because I had any specific foresight. It's just, I could see how bad crises are. And a lot of people nowadays, even very successful people, they've only known one market cycle, like from 2011 to 2020, it was just a nine year boom. And that's, not the norm real estate doesn't go up and up for decades it'll eventually go down again and when it does a lot of businesses even good businesses get hurt and you know ironically it's, it's the ones that i think had that kind of get rich slow conservative approach will will get hurt less but you know if somebody told me in 2011 that you're you're good for another nine years colin i'd have been gambling everything every year but you know i didn't know that uh, but I'm, I'm fine with with how i went you see any similarities today that you know what well, you know prior to 2008 because you know the what you know I mean, the big short right the movie when they're at the strip club and the stripper's like oh yeah i got five houses right and you hear stuff like that <laughs> or do you see any similarities today because you know when i see a new coaching program come out and i see a new this when i see that stuff just coming out of, you know every day something different i just ask myself okay you know that's like bitcoin when you know your grandma's best friend is buying bitcoin when it's at mm. twenty thousand. you know that's typically the time that you know the merry-go-round's about to stop but being that you've you've seen the other side of the coin um are there any similarities or if they're not you know what do you see why the fundamentals strong for another blank years yeah i mean it's a tough one isn't it i mean on the one hand you didn't have the same exuberance in 2019 that you did in 2007 where like you say you had strippers with condos your taxi drivers investing in you know single family homes all over the place you'd airline pilots getting 20 or 30 mortgages you'd all sorts of silliness where i mean the the, the last crisis was brought about by excessive lending and stupid lending and giving loans to people that should never be giving loans and building properties just for the sake of building properties where there was no demand for them so there was a huge amount of excess building, excess lending, and that wasn't the case now. The population has always been growing faster than the amount of inventory in the US. Lending standards have been quite, you know, relatively strict for the last seven or eight years. You, you have to qualify for a loan in 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19. You can get a good rate, but you still have to qualify. You still have to have some money and evidence of, of income. Um, so, you know, I think people are a lot more careful. There's a ton more equity now in the system than there was in 2008. I mean, property prices would literally have to fall by half in order for most people to be underwater nowadays. So there's, you know, this pandemic is a totally different animal to the credit default swap fiasco and all the rest of it. It's very, very different. But on the other hand, we've had a 10 year boom and it, it has to stop eventually. There has to be an adjustment. It's not, most of the time it's not like a road runner falling off a cliff adjustment like it was in 2008. It's often just like a little, ebbs and flows and we'd lots of those they come every usually eight or nine years so we're definitely we were definitely due another one and the pandemic definitely kind of accelerated it but just as the pandemic was accelerating it then you have the government coming in and just throwing trillions of dollars at the system which again stops that roadrunner moment and so I, I just don't know john it's it's just too hard to say uh, i think you're definitely overdue we're overdue an adjustment for real estate prices you can't just keep increasing every year for 10 years and then you know do another 10 years after that i don't think so um this is a very different type of crisis i wasn't seeing the same kind of silliness in the last five years i was seeing a lot of people just building real estate portfolios just working hard saving money some people were getting creative using credit cards to do birth strategies or whatever and that's that's their own individual risk there's nothing systemic about that they're just risking their own bankruptcies but and a lot of the time you can get away with it in a good market with with a good plan so i think there's a reckoning coming but it still might be a couple of years away i mean this this could go on this kind of limbo we're in this kind of gap between the lockdown and, and the, the vaccine this gap could last a long time and and real estate prices might not fall much at all until until afterwards 
Yeah, it's interesting to hear you talk about the equity side because one of the things we've been looking at is the number of single family homes that have gone into forbearance since this all started. And Mm -hmm. I believe actually that program ran out yesterday, which was the 31st of August. I don't know if it got extended, um, but it was quite a large amount. I think John, what was it? It was up of like a third or something yeah, like that, or something fairly high. Amount. By the way, Wells Fargo is being sued by borrowers because they're saying that they were not informed that their loans were in forbearance when they stopped making payments on them. So it's it's comical, but yeah, there was like a third of uh, homeowners that. Why would you, you know, stop making payments? They were in forbearance basically, but they're saying that they were not basically because of the pandemic. What these borrowers assumed, and it was in the real deal. I believe it was a real deal. The borrowers are basically saying that, you know, there was a pandemic. We didn't know that we, we had the money, but we would have made the payments. We didn't realize that we'd have a forbearance on our record. We thought that we just didn't have to pay and we could make it up. So they're actually suing Wells Fargo because they're saying Wells Fargo did not report to them accurately that they would go into forbearance for not paying their mortgage. They thought that they were just waived and they would be able to pay it in the future. So I read that this morning. I thought that's it was funny. funny. So they thought they could request forbearance, but but not have forbearance beside their name after requesting it. Exactly. Because that was, that was a big thing when this all happened. You know, mm-hmm. listen, if you need it, you have to take it. But if you didn't need it, you know, there was a good school of thought. I'm just not going to pay. It happened to some of our tenants who didn't want to pay rent. But it, it, it does negatively impact you. I mean, you do get a little bit of a black eye when you have to report to your next bank or your next lender or whatever. Yeah, I, I had a forbearance. Yeah, it's, it's in the pandemic. And maybe it's overlooked in six months, 12 months, 10 years, whatever it is. But, yeah. you know, they were pissed that they, you know, they were not properly informed or like I said, it was, you know, I, you know, who knows? It's just borrowers pissed about everything. So it happens. But uh, it was fun. It was comical because I, I don't, I don't know if it was, I think it's state by state at this point. Some states have a little bit more flexibility with homeowners and tenants and others don't. And you know, some, some are already giving those benefits for unemployment and stuff like that. So I think it's going to vary a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And look, there's a big difference between the forbearance side of things and the eviction because for, like I said, there's so much equity in most of the single family homes around the country that if they ever need to sell that house, even though they skipped six or 12 months of payments, that's just going to get deducted from the sales price. And you're still going to have some equity left over and it'll get paid one way or the other, unless unless something very unusual happened, then there's a big price drop. The eviction is a whole other thing where you have these landlords that haven't received rent for three, four, five, six months. I know from experience, if a tenant hasn't paid rent for two months, your chances of getting it back are like less than 5%. You're not getting it back. And so if they can't pay up that six months rent or a four months rent or five months rent, they're going to have to get evicted eventually. And obviously that stuff keeps getting extended with, with, with limitations. The governor, governor DeSantis in Florida just extended it another month, you know, until October 1st last night, you know, he's been doing it since April 1st. So, you know, the evictions are going to be problematic, I think much more so than the, the forbearance. 100%. And, uh, but again, well, how's that going to affect things? They're, they're not the property owners, but, I don't know how much landlords are suffering. I mean, I'm personally okay. My, my tenants have been, have been paying. I'm, I'm good. But clearly there's, you know, millions of other landlords that, that aren't good, you know, in the residential yep. side. I'm not even talking about commercial. Yeah. Well, I think that that's where I was going before we dovetailed was that, you know, we were talking like, hey, there's going to be these tons of foreclosures. I mean, you know, probably a third of people didn't have to take forbearance. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that means some people did. And if people can't pay, 10% unemployment, there's going to be foreclosures, but then started hearing about, you know, more equity than ever before in homes. And like you said, it has a cushion, which allows you to sell for less because you're not borrowing at this crazy high rate. Although the slew of recent refinances that have happened may change that because rates sure. are crazy low and, you know, home prices are going crazy. I mean, here it's ridiculous. I was just talking to my cousins who are agents and it's like, they're getting offers like, Thirty thousand dollars over asking with like nothing. It's crazy. I mean, no, there's no inventory, was, so it's supply and demand. But it is interesting to see how that's going to be affected. And you see back and forth of like, you know, is the equity going to protect people, or is there just going to be a slew of foreclosures that is going to affect the market and the residential market once things start opening back up and once all this money disappears from COVID? And I'm curious how you guys are looking at this in the next you know, from today inside the next 12 months of, is this going to be another opportunity to pick up condos for 
you know, $75,000 or is this going to be, you know, kind of just steady along and just kind of muddle along for the next couple of years? Yeah. Or are you really not sure? I mean, you have to figure that, I don't know how long it's going to take, but you have to figure that eventually the banks are going to control a ton of real estate again, just as mm -hmm. they did 10 years ago. And it took them years to get through all those REOs and all those foreclosures. It wasn't a quick process, especially in judicial states like Florida. You know, the foreclosures move slowly. So, but I think eventually the, the you know, there will be a, I mean, just with, I mean, the four parents might not cause a spike in foreclosures because of the equity, but the unemployment will cause a spike in foreclosures. That's the biggest predictor of mortgage defaults is unemployment. Mm -hmm. So that, that will cause a spike in foreclosures. And eventually then banks are obviously going to get all those judgments and they're going to control all that inventory. And there's going to be a, a spike in, in REOs and there's going to be a spike in foreclosures, but it, it could take a while. I mean, I used to buy at least five houses a month in foreclosure auctions in Tampa and you know, they've been mostly shut for the last five months. I managed to actually buy one last Thursday, which was unusual because it was a, it was a, it was an uncontested uh, foreclosure. The defendant didn't contest it and, and it was, it was vacated two days after the foreclosure. So I kind of got lucky with that one, but the majority of them, if you've any kind of competent attorney at all, you just get them canceled and canceled and canceled as long as you want. So, you know, it could, it could take a while, Chris. It could, I don't know how long they're going to, at the minute, it looks like they're going to keep extending these moratoriums until after the election. So maybe next year you're going to start seeing a spike. Um, but again, there's a limit to how much every county can physically process. So, and the banks aren't going to just dump them on the market either because they're not, they're not suffering the way they were. They're not suffering the equity losses. They're not suffering the liquidity problems that they were 10 years ago either. They're far better capitalized. So I think they'll just kind of be dribbling them out at, at a rate that demand kind of picks up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could be a while before we get deals, but at least we'll see a surge in inventory because at the minute inventory is so tight, like you're saying, your friends are anything listed immediately gets full price over full price offers, waiving all sorts of contingencies. And I'm, I'm seeing that in Tampa, you know, and in, in my little buy box, we're at about a month's inventory, whereas even a busy market should be at least three months inventory. It's just mm -hmm. ridiculously tight and, and people are willingly overpaying for, for, for real estate that they know is, is not worth it. They're, whether it's renovated or unrenovated, it's just trying to get something to rent out or something to live in. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. So I want to come back a little bit and um, go back to your story a little bit because I think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. When you started overseas, because I think it's somewhat relatable to a lot of people that do it out of state, just farther distance, maybe some water in between. Um, when and why did you decide to move to Florida? Was it a business decision, a personal decision? What was that like? Yeah, it was, it was very much a business decision because my, my wife is, is Spanish and we got married in Spain, raised two kids in Spain. And, you know, this is, I got married in 2008 and kids in 2010 and 12. And I kind of started doing real estate in Florida full time around 2010. But I didn't want to leave didn't want to leave Spain. I've always been conscious of the benefits of a location independent uh, income stream. And even though I knew back in those early 2010s, if I moved to Florida, I could earn more money. I was also aware that Madrid's a pretty nice place to live. It's not like, you know, a lot of people might be living in, in poor countries in Central and South America and, and the US is this kind of shining light and this higher quality of life. I already had a pretty good <laughs> quality of life in Spain. It's a nice place, you know, nice weather, nice food, nice people, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I had business partners here and, and that was, you know, the main reason I was able to run a successful business with, with business partners. So, you know, clearly I was buying properties at auction from Madrid, you know, which I couldn't have done in the nineties, obviously, because they weren't mm -hmm. online and I wasn't able to look up all the public record stuff that I was now, but you know, you need people to drive by them. You need people to, to get in there. You need people to renovate them and inspect them. So you have to have local people to do all that stuff. And um, if you have, then I've no qualms about investing out of state or overseas. I own rentals out of state now. And, you know, still overseas people are buying here. But it's, it's not, you have to plan it out. You have to map it out. You need a business plan. You need systems in place. You, you can't just accept any kind of crap email that comes through your inbox you had to have a 
make a plan. Obviously, I had to travel over here quite a lot to decide which neighborhoods we wanted to go deep in, because that's how we ultimately became successful was going literally an inch wide and, and a mile deep. We weren't, you know, before we used to sell and promote properties all over the map, whereas it was only really when we became experts in a little pocket of, of Northwest Tampa that we saw a lot of success. So I needed to become an expert in that area, which involves traveling back and forth, getting my business partners literally up there every single day, driving around. And it, it works. I mean, you, you, you can do it from overseas. You can do it from out of state. There's very, li- very minor limits nowadays to what you can't achieve with a strong internet connection, but you can never replace field time either. I mean, you, you, if you're not doing the field time, somebody needs to be doing the field time. You cannot become a successful real estate investor without significant hours on the field. You, you need both. So if you have a, a right-hand man, uh, you can sit on your computer in, you know, in Kansas or Dublin or Singapore or wherever you want and invest in real estate and, and you can get it done. I mean, obviously one of the limitations I had was, was the financing, but obviously as a flipper, we just used our own money literally for the first say 15 flips. And then obviously we had enough of a track record to approach some private money, some people that we'd sold other real estate to. So we used, we used private money for that. And then when it came to getting my own rentals as a non us resident, again, I had to get reasonably creative. Um, one of the things I did was to uh, kind of the birth strategy where you kind of buy renovate uh, properties with private money and then wait until you have five or six of them and then refinance them all with a commercial loan. That's mm-hmm. doable for a, a non-US resident. So I did that. Uh, another one is to partner with a private lender on a long-term note. So I did that as well, where I own some rentals with a, with a wealthy investor based in Boston, where he, he gave me a 15 year loan, you know, at I think about six and a half or 7%, uh, which was a high rate, but he, he would give me as many loans as, as I could get. And, and he was an equity partner in those deals and the lender. So that was another creative way of, of me owning rentals without, you know, tapping the conservative loans. And then obviously once I moved here in kind of 2016, early 2017, again, despite kind of buying and selling millions of dollars of real estate over many years, I was coming over here with the credit score of, of an 18 year old college kid and the car insurance premiums of an 18 year old college kid. And I had to wait a good year even to just get a, a mortgage to buy a house, a nice house to live in, you know, and, and again, but again, once you get over the first year and a half, and again, it's not easy try bringing a wife and kids to, to a new country is his own challenge. And that was a lot of work integrating my Spanish kids into school and, you know, getting my wife settled and then getting her, you know, organized with a good job as well. So there's a lot of challenges in the first year and a half, but after that kind of really accelerated the business when I had kind of my family settled, I was able to, you know, stay here on the ground and focus on accelerating from, you know, doing 50 flips a year to 70 a year to a hundred a year. And, and it's, it's, it's been great. Mm-hmm. I think that's interesting. So how were you able to scale to that level? Was it because you just had multiple partners? Was it because you guys started with that, you know, the other stuff in 2010 and it was just built on top of that? Or was it when you moved over, a lot of those things just became significantly easier? Well, after I moved over, we were able to obviously meet more often and strategize more often and and hire the right kinds of people and, and, mm-hmm. and put systems and processes in place. I mean, we, we expanded our, our credit lines. Uh, we were going deep in an area, so we didn't have to learn brand new areas. We just started buying more properties in the same area. So we were able to kind of uh, expand our crews in, in, a, in a similar area. We had two or three crews working with us more or less full time. Um, we, we, you know, started networking with other fix and flippers and, and learned, learned from them, learn how they're borrowing money, how they're insuring their properties how they're doing their scopes of work, you know, how they're preparing them, how are they using them, how are they getting them photographed. Mm-hmm. We also linked up with, uh, you know, investor groups. So we were able to almost outsource our sales where we had a steady stream of out-of-state investors, a lot of Californian-based investors who were just kind of lining up to buy our renovated single-family homes. So we didn't have to just list it on the MLS and wait 30, 40 days and field low-ball offers or anything like that. We were able to just focus on buying more renovating them quicker and 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 just get them sold and um it's just just work you know you, you've you've done it chris i mean it's just it's just work you, you you try and get better you try and get smarter even small stuff like uh you know hiring a va 
to help me with the, the sourcing. You know, I used to literally do everything, like look at the MLS, look at Zillow, look at the auction sites, input everything into a spreadsheet, look up the permit records, do, do the comps, write the offers, you know, negotiate the offers, send the deposits, you know, everything. Whereas if you can get a, you know, the whole 80, 20 thing, if you can get a VA to do 80% of the kind of donkey work, so I can just focus on the 20% analyzing the, uh, the after repair value, it's a lot more efficient. And then you get better at bird dogs where they get the bird dogs to send you the photos of the property. You get them to map out a draft renovation scope in advance. You get them to put it into your spreadsheet for you. So you can just go through a lot more properties in a, in a smaller length of time and even smaller stuff like buying extra monitors. <laughs> I have three monitors now. I used to just have one for a very long time, one small one. And now I've got three 21 inch monitors where you can have, you know, email and calendars and spreadsheets and, and public records and, and everything just gets a lot more efficient when you combine that with, with VAs and stronger credit lines and more competent bird dogs and more, more efficient uh, crews. And my business partner was, was managing the crews extremely well, getting projects delivered very quickly. So it's just a process where we're all kind of determined to, to do more and more and more. What's bird dogs? I've never heard of that. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, so that's when you send somebody to drive by a property. You know, bird dog and hunting, you, they, they kind of point where, where the gotcha. bird is so the hunter can get it. So they, they, they're the guys that I said, I have these six properties coming up next week that I want to bid on. They drive by the six properties, take photos, tell me if they're vacant or occupied. Let me know what state the roofs or ACs are in or the exteriors. And, and they're just giving me the, the kind of field information on, on what the house looks like without me having to personally go there. Gotcha. That's what I assume, but want to be sure. Um, so I'm really curious because you said, you know, you had the experience with the big office and now you guys are more remote and working from home, but it sounds like you guys still get together quite frequently to kind of strategize or you did. I don't know if you still do. How are you <laughs> viewing, um, you know, the working environment of, you know, there's now the conversation of complete remote work from home, you know, online zoom calls versus like you know the traditional office setting or like a hybrid like it sounds like you've had an experience of almost you know from the top down um yeah. how are you looking at that whole situation as you continue to build and operate a real estate company yeah still trying to figure it out i mean look the zoom calls are, are pretty efficient they're pretty effective i mean it, you, you do need to have an agenda and stick to it you know you can't just have a rambling two hour kind of zoom call every Monday morning. I mean, you do need to have an agenda and stick to it. You do need to have, and, and, and to be honest that the kind of strategy stuff should really be only once a quarter. And then the regular meetings, if you can do it in a text message or, or, you know, on what's it called on Slack, you know, better than, than just ringing somebody to chat or rather just text someone saying, send an electrician to so-and-so you know, and just get it done. So I, I try and minimize the, the, the talking, <laughs> ironically, but it is important to, to kind of have a, a plan in place where you have a strategy and you have goals and you need, you need to do that. And then you need to base your, your decisions afterwards need to be working towards those goals. And you need to wake up on a Monday morning and say, what do I need to do this week to work towards the pre agreed goals? But, you know, uh, I, I think it is, it can be a lot more efficient working from an office than being in an office and getting tapped on the shoulder all the time and, being distracted with, you know, stories or, Hey, did you see the game last night? And that's all good for a little bit of rapport, but you know, you kind of waste a lot of time just talking to people or, you know, checking your YouTube or whatever. I might, I prefer, I've never been a workaholic, you know, ironically, I've always been someone who's worked a pretty normal day an eight hour day and then gone home and just enjoyed my evening with the kids or my buddies or, or whatever. So I've never been someone who just wants to stare at a computer screen all day long. So I try and make my, my time is as efficient as possible. And, and I think uh, the COVID, you know, COVID hasn't really impacted that negatively. You know, I've, I was working from home anyway, mm -hmm. and um, I've, I've just kind of kept, kept up with the habits I already had. Yeah, I think that's good. So is there anything going forward you guys are looking at both, you know, in the work environment and the real estate stuff? Are you guys shifting plans at all? Are you guys going to be focusing more on the REO side? Like, how are you guys viewing the future? Or are you still, you know, game planning because things are kind of still up in the air? 
Well, you know, like back in January, I, f- I felt like I was in a sports car just driving down a road on a sunny day. And now yeah. I feel like I'm in a Hyundai driving through the fog and the rain. I mean, I'm going very slowly, mm-hmm. like really slowly. I'm, I'm doing like a deal every now and again rather than multiple deals mm-hmm. per week. So I've slowed it down a lot. I mean, part of me wants to keep my powder. At, back in March and April, I was kind of knee jerk reaction. Like I'm, I'm pulling out. I'm not buying anything. Got to just hoard all my cash, keep my powder dry. There's going to be a huge crash and I'm, I'm going to make out like a bandit later in the year. But, you know, thanks to those, you know, trillion dollars here and trillion dollars there, that's not going to happen now. Whereas now I'm kind of deciding, well, okay, I'm putting my, I'm just going to get back in the market again a little bit more carefully because this, this adjustment might not be until the end of next year. And I'm not going to sit in my hands for a whole year waiting for something to happen. So it's more about deciding what proportion of my assets I want to invest between now and the inevitable downturn and, and just kind of proceed with, with caution. And, and to be honest, my, my business partners had slightly different ideas as well. They, they were much more gung ho than I was. So they've kind of gone ahead and, and, you know, bought a bunch of properties themselves, you know, high price properties. They've started promoting kind of uh, pre-construction properties on behalf of other developers, which wasn't really my thing at all. You know, and I, I just kind of set up a website and did a bunch of reports and set up a new podcast and just kind of dipped my toe in the market. And I've kind of specialized in buying, you know, a, got a few houses in foreclosures. I've got a couple off market, just ones that need very light work, ones that I can be in and out of in, in kind of 60 days, 70 days. So I've, I've done a few of those, but I'm, I'm mostly keeping my, my main aggressive plays clear until I see what way this is panning out. And then in the meantime, I'm just kind of dipping my toe in the market. I've, I've stepped up lending ironically to other flippers because I'm, I'm, I might be reluctant to, to kind of flip a property because a 10% drop can wipe out your entire profit margin and then some. But if I'm lending to somebody like 60% LTV and getting a nice double digit interest rate for it, I'm, I'm kind of okay doing that. Mm-hmm. And I've done some loan notes and I bought a couple of rentals because I, I was able to get them cheap and renovate them cheap. But I'm, I'm, I'm less active now than I was kind of eight months ago. I know a lot of people are more active. Some lenders are super active. A lot of your, your agent buddies are, are super active because real estate, if you're representing sellers, this is a great time to be in the game. Um, but, uh, you know, I've, I've done well enough the last five years, six years that I, I could afford the luxury of, of slowing down from fifth gear to second gear. And I've kind of done that. I'm not slowing down to a stop. I want to keep going. I want to keep making sure there's more money coming in than going out. But I, I think the real opportunities for kind of wealth accumulation will, will be further down the line. I mean, that you can, can keep doing stuff to generate income, you know, for the next few quarters. But I think the wealth generating possibilities are further down the line, just as the people that were able to buy real estate in 2010, 11, 12, 13 and, and hold it, they generated real wealth. That was proper wealth. I think you're, you're going to have something along those lines, but it might not be for another year and a half, two years, two and a half years. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to tell when every single asset price is going up simultaneously. It's a very unusual place. Yeah. I mean, we had the same reaction as you very early on when COVID hit kind of, you know, I don't want to say pull the ripcord, but, you know, very heavily take a step back from anything we were doing. Um, and I mean, transactions and deals just kind of fell by the wayside and we just focused on you know, managing our own portfolio and managing tenants. Cause at the time everybody thought, you know, unemployment was going to go crazy. Nobody was going to be able to pay rent. I mean, we did scenarios where we had 30, 40, 50% of income going away and it wasn't nearly that bad so far, you know, knock mm-hmm. on wood. Um, so yeah, it was interesting to hear that, but what was, what was the conversation like between you and your partners then? Because if you guys were viewing it very differently, um, you know, what was, what were they seeing? What were they thinking? Like, what was some of their reasoning that they were like, Hey, you know, this isn't that big of a deal or, you know, we're still going, or we're going to this pre-development thing. Like what were those conversations like? Yeah, it was a difficult conversation because these guys that I've been in business with for like 10 years and we had pretty different opinions on what to do with the business and what to do with, with our money for the, for the first time in a long time. I mean, you always have your differences, but you hammer out a strategy that everybody signs up to. But back in March, April, I guess, I guess the distress in our market and everybody was getting panicky. I mean, that, that kind of consensus just wasn't there. I mean, I guess if we had, you know, it, it just wasn't there. And, and maybe part of it was just 
been together a long time and part of me probably just wanted to try something different anyway there's a little bit of that too to be honest mm-hmm. with you chris but it was a tough decision they wanted to continue doing stuff with with the company's money doing you know doing transactions that i didn't really want my my money being part of i said i i, I really want to to stop those types of transactions for a while i want to hold back i want to try and cash in a little bit and, and see what the lie of the land is and and you know, they, they were, I mean, and in fairness, they, they were in somewhat vindicated because there has been, you, you have been able to make money for the last five, six months, you know, and yeah. it has anybody that slammed on the brakes has, has lost money compared to people that kept their foot on the gas. But I still don't regret it because, you know, some of these people still have their foot on the gas and that they might have that roadrunner moment in, in December. Uh, I mean, I just don't know, but it was, it was a difficult conversation and we, but in the end, we just agreed so, okay, well, let's let's do this equitably. Let's just cash out. We'll you form an LLC to do whatever you want to do with your cash. We'll form an LLC to do what we want to do with our cash. And, and the different properties that, that we own that are still being renovated and sold, we'll get those renovated and sold. And the ones that we own as rentals together, because we own quite a few rentals together, we we we'll, we'll just keep those. We just mm-hmm. there's no rush with that. We just they're all they're all doing fine. And um, but it's you know they're, they're, it's not easy doing that stuff. You need to have a pretty thick skin uh, being a business owner. You know. Yeah, I hear you. No, those are interesting conversations, and especially when you have all different structures and partnerships in place, um, it can become entangled pretty quick. How are you able to kind of navigate those waters without damaging relationships or doing anything like that? Was it setting clear expectations up front? Is it just being very blunt and honest as things come up? What has helped you be successful when that stuff has happened? Yeah, just being transparent, being honest. And, and you know, a lot of the stuff back in March, April, May, I mean, you had, you know, had kids at home. You're like basically homeschooling people because my wife is Spanish and wasn't mm-hmm. as able to homeschool the, the kids with their bullshit apps and websites and logins for five different things and all sorts of crap. So I was literally just tied up and too busy to actually do much work for for quite a while either and 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 you know i had the benefit of a strong passive income stream as well so i knew i didn't need to keep working i didn't need to keep taking what i thought was a big risk because i thought investing in fifth gear in march april may was a big risk and i didn't need to take it because i had enough i had enough money i had enough passive income coming in anyway to kind of do what i wanted and part of it was was just that um, another part of it is I'll probably move back to Spain in the near future as well. So I was kind of had another eye on that too, you know, because again, I'm, I'm a big fan of location independence and financial freedom. So I, I think COVID just kind of accelerated a bunch of stuff that was bubbling in my head anyway, if I'm going to be honest about it, Chris. Um, but, you know, in terms of, of our, how the paths have diverged, it's just being, being honest, being transparent, uh, communicating clearly, with, with all the investors we had in common, making a commitment to honoring promises we'd make to people, making a commitment to kind of stand by and, and, and deal with any issues resulting from the hundreds of properties we've sold. I mean, we literally the Torcana is, is still there. It's still Torcana's sold, you know, hundred plus million dollars worth of properties in the last few years. There's a lot of clients there that, that are gonna need assistance with one thing or another. So just kind of committed to kind of sticking with that and staying together and doing everything in the open and, and not, nobody's you know just not getting selfish about it i mean we're, we're and we're still working through it uh but it's so far so good uh so far so good and um you know these these things are never easy but i have to say it's, it's i haven't lost any sleep over it for for quite a few months it's, it's working out absolutely fine we, we still chat every week about stuff that we have in common we're still interested in what each other's doing i still ask him advice on some stuff i'm dealing with he asked me advice on some stuff he's dealing with so it's it's actually fine it's, it could have been a lot worse love it no i think that's the right way to do it um i also think that's a, a great place to wrap it up so colin thank you so much for coming on uh it was tremendous great to hear your insight uh, i think it'll give people a very different perspective than a lot of other people uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, learn more about you, follow you, where can they do all that stuff? Yeah, thanks, man. It's been a pleasure. Easiest place is to go to a website, colininvestments.com. That's C-O-L-I-N, investments.com. I have a podcast called Colin Podcasts about real estate. You'll, you'll find that. You'll find my social media links on the website as well. And, and feel free to get in touch with me about anything at all related to real estate. <clears throat> Beautiful. Uh, guys, definitely go check it out. Go check out the website. It'll be in the show notes if you don't want to type it in. And 
Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you're not already subscribed, it would mean the world to John and I if you would do so. And if you are, please send it to somebody who you think would get a tremendous amount of value from it. Colin, once again, thanks for coming on, bud. My pleasure.